uh, St. John Chrysostom said, to suffer for Jesus Christ is something greater than to raise someone from the dead. And we saw this recently in the reading. By the first, I contract a debt toward God. By the second, Jesus Christ becomes my debtor. What a wonderful thing. Jesus Christ gives me a gift, and for this gift, he makes himself my debtor. In other words, that the tribulation that you suffer, or afflictions, whatever it is, uh, put, uh, are meritorious, just as if you did some work and your employer owes you money. That's what he means by this, is that these are very meritorious. Now, affliction can be anything. Any kind of negativity, you might say. It could be temptations, which is the most probably the common. Uh, it could be uh, some mental disease. It could be some physical disease. It could be some trouble, like family trouble, spouse trouble, uh, all kinds of trouble. Uh, financial troubles. Uh, There's it, it, all kinds of things that can visit us in this life. And so those are all afflictions, you see, and uh, we have to see the value of them. Don't forget, there's three things that our Lord pointed out for eternal life. First, you have to deny yourself. He said these three things. Deny yourself, that's big. Two is to carry your cross... And three is follow me. It's in the gospel. It says it in one sentence. So these afflictions are, are number two, is carrying your cross. And if you see the value of them, you are then following him. In other words, if you offer them up and... Uh, accept them in a good spirit, you are following our Lord. He carried a cross. St. Giles, who was a disciple of St. Francis, said, when the Lord makes stones and rocks fall from heaven, we would not receive from them any evil if we knew how to bear up with afflictions. St. John Chrysostom again, look at Joseph. From being a captive, he soon becomes the head of all Egypt. There is the advantage of afflictions courageously borne. His patience is unbreakable. The trials do not beat him down. After he has been tried, God finds him worthy of himself and blesses him. St. Cyprian said, sufferings are wings by which I fly to heaven. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, you see that the afflictions of the flesh increase the strength of the spirit and give it courage. The strength of the flesh, on the contrary, weakens that of the spirit. Why is it surprising that the sufferings of the body should fortify the soul? You weaken an enemy, and by that you become stronger. How do we love this flesh, which does not cease to rise up against the spirit? It is with wisdom and reason that the psalmist asks God to send him afflictions. Pierce thou my flesh with thy fear. And he finishes by saying, the fear of the Lord is an excellent arrow. St. Gregory Nazianzen says, a soul that is afflicted with disease is close to God. Again, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, 
Through afflictions, lust is conquered, the virtues are born and become strong, the corruptive flesh is subdued, the soul <coughs> is lifted to heaven on the wings of the virtues. By afflictions and sufferings, the flesh loses what is superfluous and the soul acquires qualities that were lacking to it. If therefore the afflictions, these gifts of the Lord, make the virtues increase, if they diminish and expel vices, if they inspire us in us the contempt of the goods of the earth and the love of celestial things, they assure for us an eternal happiness. By these considerations, we have to become strong. The more that the struggle should be, become painful, the more brilliant will be our victory. We prove that we want to please God and that we love him when we go to him, not only when it is calm, but even in the middle of afflictions and persecutions. It is not permitted that we get to heaven by, any, by another road than by that of the cross. This is why we must bear afflictions and love him. Excuse me, love them. See, so it's an integral part of Catholic spirituality. Very unlike any kind of Protestant Christianity, if you want to call it that. Totally, totally distinct. Psalm 114, verses 3 and 4 says, The sorrows of death have encompassed me, and the perils of hell have found me. I met with trouble and sorrow, and I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, deliver my soul. And Psalm 138, verse 1 Lord, thou hast proved me and known me. Domine coniuvistime et coniu. Domine probastime et coniuvistime. Famous verse. God is the one who sends us afflictions. It is he who has determined their number, their weight, and measure. You see, God has. This is something called the predestination of the elect. That if you are one of the elect, he has determined the exact way in which he's going to save your soul. He's going to determine all of the afflictions. He'll determine where you're born. He'll determine what family you're born into, what influences you come under, etc. He, all of those things are part of the decree of predestination. We'll talk about that in De Deo Uno. All right, so and part of that is the afflictions. There's the, the, the proof, how, how you're going to prove your love of God. Uh, we just had in the breviary today, St. Uh, uh, John had a mystical experience, St. John of the Cross. What do you ask of me in return? Just as St. Thomas. And he said, only that I suffer for thee. So the the uh, and Saint Teresa, to 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 suffer or to die. So the 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 more they approach God, the more they understand this principle of being crucified with our Lord, both for the reason of crucifying the old man of sin, and for the reason of conforming ourselves to the sacrificial Christ. So he has determined the, their number, their weight, and their measure. And he also has determined what graces he is going to give you to bear those things and how you will use them. And he has planned them from all eternity for each one of those whom he loves, his cross and his suffering. So he has planned a cross for you and he has planned sufferings for you. And ironically, the, the more he loves you, the more crosses you're going to get. It's, it's a very, 
It's this life, and the reason for this is because this life is, we might say, defined by sin. It's defined by the effects of original sin, and it's defined by actual sin and its effects. When I say defined, that it, it is such a, a covering of everything we do. It gets into every single thing we do. Every single moment of the day is a struggle against some temptation. Uh, the, the flesh is rebelling. The, the pride is rebelling. There's, there's always a pushback that we have to have. That's all part of this. So sin is, you know, the effects of sin even on the earth, you know, the, the, the heat and the cold and disease and, you know, and, uh, the effects of sin in people's minds, you know, people's socialists, for example, the fact that they're around, making life miserable for everybody. You know, all, all the craziness, it's all due to sin. I mean, we, we just, it's, it's a world of sin. And, and therefore, the, the way out is, is, this, is the cross. So it's very important to understand that, you know, why do we have to suffer? If this were paradise, that would be a good question. If we were still Adam and Eve and their children and walking around in a paradise, none of this would be true. And the question, why do we have to suffer, would be a very good question. But it's, we have to understand that this is not a paradise. This is a, a place that is, if, if not defined, it is so conditioned by sin and the effects of sin that we have to come to terms with that. It's something to you know, think about in your spiritual lives. This is a, a planet of sin. All right? You know, from God's point of view, it is, it is a stinking place. It, is, it, it, it emits a, a constant odor, we might say, if God had a nose. A constant odor of sin. It's true. It's like a, a pile of dog dirt with flies around it. What he created is beautiful. The earth is beautiful, what he created. But what man has made out of it is, is a pile of dung with flies on it and maggots. It's, sins are constantly multiplied, and the effects of those sins are constantly multiplied. We have to realize the lives that we lead here. And it is also defined by death. Old age, disease, and death. You have to think about all of those things. All those things have to be deeply considered in your minds. You're all young now. Look at old people. People who can hardly walk and who are demented and who, who you know, you may well be like that one day. Unless you die young. They were all as young and, and you know, just like yourself, vibrant, no problems, can do anything. Now they're the way they are. You will be that way one day too. You have to think about that. So he has decreed to strip us of the old man. That's what needs to be done. The old man of sin must die on the cross. In other words, we must crucify the old man of sin. That's St. Paul. It's the reason for mortification. And he will clothe us in patience, purity, grace, and love in these tribulations. All of those virtues will come forth from the patient bearing of tribulations and afflictions. He has resolved to draw us to heaven by this road. 
pick up your cross and follow me. That's the road to heaven. The road to hell is a beautiful paved freeway, you know, autobahn or motorway, whatever you want to call it. Beautiful, wide, everybody zooming down. Okay. The road to heaven is a narrow path that is beset with thorn bushes and rocks and nasty wasps and bees, scorpions, and it goes up. St. John of the Cross mentions that. So, therefore, who would flee and have horror of suffering inasmuch as they are given us as a gift and that by the infinite goodness of God? Think of people who are born with disorders, like people with uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, the, the Down syndrome. Think of that cross. You know, or other, other disorders, all kinds of physical and mental disorders, where they can't do anything about it. You know, they have their crosses to bear. There are people that, you know, lose their legs or you know, an accident, something that isn't even their own fault, military people. Afflictions conform us to our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross in order to conform us to our Lord in his glory. So the, the path to glory is by the cross. That's Catholic spirituality. St. Basil said, illnesses are the whip which scourges sinners. They, this is still St. Basil. They urge us to change our lives and to convert a holy priest prescribed one day, this is still St. Bagel, Bagel, Basil, one day this remedy to one of his disciples who was sick, saying, Don't be troubled, my son, by your infirmity. It is proper to perfect piety to give thanks to God for the afflictions that he sends. If you are like iron, the fire of suffering will take away from you the rust that tarnishes you. If you are like gold, it will make you more pure. Therefore, bear this affliction and pray that the will of God be accomplished in you. So if you're iron, it's going to take the rust away. If it's gold, it's going to make you 24 karat. Did you ever see gold ore? It's just a rock. It has gold running through it. That has to be all. Purified in the fire. St. Paul, the famous quote from St. Paul, Hebrews, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. There it is. That's a shocking sentence. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. He's writing to the, as I told you, the priests in Jerusalem who are afraid of persecution. St. John Chrysostom, let us not consider that afflictions are a mark that, that God has abandoned us and that he has, that he has contempt for us. Rather, on the contrary, it is a greater proof that God is concerned about us because he purifies us of our sins and furnishes to us ample means in order to merit his grace and his protection. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, frequent afflictions are a type of martyrdom. It is a kind of shedding of blood. 
So the bearing of afflictions, particularly long-term afflictions, uh, is a type of martyrdom. It's a suffering that is offered to God. What, what else is martyrdom? I think we'll stop. Oh, St. John Chrysostom. Let us not flee afflictions, but let us flee sin, because sin is truly the affliction. Beautiful quote. St. Augustine said this, The present life is but a painful and wearisome, a foul and tedious journey, a wretched, decaying, and uncertain life, a life of labor, and which is worse, a life of sin and pride and folly, full of miseries and errors, and rather death than life. It's a very famous quote of St. Augustine. Since, it is, since in it we die daily, by the constant decays and alterations of our bodies and the sundry kinds of death to which we stand every moment exposed. And can we in any propriety of speech call this living? Does that empty thing deserve the name of life, which is blotted with tumors, macerated with pains, burnt up with fevers, blasted by an infected air, fattened with eating, brought down with fasting, enervated with mirth, consumed with melancholy, shortened with care, stupefied with security, puffed up with riches, dejected by poverty, made joyful by youth, bowed down with age, broken with infirmities, and destroyed with griefs, nay, as if all these evils were too little, the conclusion of them all is the tyranny of death, which puts a speedy period to what we falsely call the joys of life and abolishes them and wears out all the footsteps and remembrances of them so utterly that it is from thenceforth as if they had never been at all. Mors ista vitalis et vita mortalis. So that means... This life, this death is has life and life has death. It's hard to translate. But uh, that's St. Augustine, a very famous quotation uh, that this is more than a death and a life, but he, he really describes human life as it is in its condition after original sin. That's not what you would call a cheerful earful. <laughs> St. Gregory says that the temporal life is, and this is a quote, is laborious and full of afflictions, which flows away into agitations and painful labor. Who is it that pain does not crucify? Which worries do not torment? Which fear does not possess? We weep and we laugh. Sadness accompanies joy. <clears throat> we are hungry and we are satisfied. But hardly is one satisfied, then hunger arrives again. That's true in the seminary. <laughs> You'd never know that you had eaten anything before when you sit down to those meals. Thirst exhausts us, heat overwhelms us, cold freezes us, as we know today. S sighs, tears, sobs everywhere, universal miseries varied to an infinite degree and without number. The rich man has his afflictions and sometimes very great, 
The poor man does not cease to have afflictions. Children are exposed to them, and great men are not exempt from them. You'll get all these, so you can contemplate these on your own. All right. St. John Chrysostom said, Just as the child is enclosed in the womb of his mother, so in this world we are surrounded by obstacles and sufferings. In the book of Job, it says, The life of man upon earth is a warfare, and his days are like the days of a hireling. Man, born of a woman, living for a short time, is filled with many miseries. If I lie down to sleep, I shall say, When shall I arise? And again I shall look for the evening, and shall be filled with sorrows, even till darkness. St. Augustine said, The entire life of a Christian man, if it should be lived according to the gospel, is a cross and a martyrdom. St. John Chrysostom said, Soldier of Jesus Christ, you are weak without strength and cowardly if you think that you can win without combat and triumph without defending yourself. Use your strength, strike valiantly, accept with courage the fury of the battle. Consider your oath, your condition, your flag, the oath that you made at your holy baptism, the condition which you have accepted, the army in which you have inscribed your name. St. Paul in all things we suffer tribulation, but are not distressed. We are straitened, but are not destitute. We suffer persecution, but are not forsaken. We are cast down, but we perish not, always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. He's referring to the stigmata there. But notice that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. There is always that theme of imitating the cross of Christ. St. Robert Bellarmine, God hears our prayer sometimes by giving us afflictions and at other times by giving us the virtue of patience. This is a greater benefit for, if, for he gives not only patience, but also joy. St. Paul, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so also by Christ doth our comfort abound. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, concerning St. Andrew, whose feast we celebrated yesterday, not only did he patiently go to the torture of the cross, but freely and willingly, even ardently, he went to his torments as if they were ornaments and to his pains as if they were delights. He told the people, don't stop. The, don't stop them from crucifying me. <laughs> people were trying to... <laughs> To stop the whole thing, they were saying you're you're crucifying an innocent man and you know pious man. He said, "Don't, no, no, don't, don't say that. You know, stop." Because they these saints understand the wisdom of the cross. That it's uh, you know they, they, as they arrive in perfection, they they understand the wisdom of the cross. St. Augustine said, Man should not complain when he suffers from adversity. By the bitterness of these things down here, he learns to love the things of heaven. As traveler, he takes the road toward his homeland. So that see, tribulations and afflictions and pains and problems do turn us to God. There was a, somebody who said in, during World War II, 
There are no atheists in a foxhole. <laughs> I forget, it was some chaplain, I think. Uh, who said that? There are no atheists in a foxhole. It's generally true that when people are visited by tribulation, they turn to God. I remember at 9-11, you're probably, you're probably all too young for that, but uh, oh, everybody became so religious when 9-11 happened. Oh, we were all on our knees. You know, it lasted for a week or two. But it was, you know, this, this religious uh, fervor and, you know, we've been struck. They do, it is, and that's why God sends it, because there's a, there's a, a natural effect, you might say, uh, that you turn to God when, when your, your earthly life turns sour. I think it's one of the reasons why you tend to see more vocations from a poorer country than from a rich country. Because they don't have the obstacles of the distraction of the things of this world. And they have a lot of the, dis the tribulations of poverty, which turn them to God. You know, in the Middle Ages, you had uh, monasteries that were loaded with, with monks. I think in England, Ravo, they, they had I don't know, a couple of hundred or something like that. Yeah, there, there were uh, Cistercian monasteries all over Europe and Benedictine monasteries. You know, the, the religious life came easily, you might say, uh, because life was difficult and life was short, too, in the Middle Ages. Even 100 years ago, life was pretty short. It was nothing to die in your 60s <clears throat> in the 1930s, and I think I may have told you when Social Security was put in, the average uh, lifespan in this country, that's, that was 1938, I think, was 67. So <clears throat> you could retire at 65 <laughs> and receive money for two years and then die. See, but modern medicine is keeping people alive more. See, normally, I should be dead by now. Uh, <laughs> My brother, who was a physician, when I had my heart problems a few years ago, uh, I was in the hospital, and he said, I told him my problems. He said, oh, you would have been dead by Christmas. It was October. He said, you would have been dead by Christmas if you didn't have that operation. So, you know, it, if I had lived 100 years earlier, I would have been dead. You see? And people died of all sorts of things, uh, flus and... You know, they didn't have uh, antibiotics and all of the things that they have now, or even they didn't even understand diseases in the Middle Ages. And you know, conditions were not very sanitary in many cases, and all s diseases multiplied, especially in cities. And uh, uh, there were plagues. Plague was common. Uh, you, know, you read in history all the plagues uh, that, that existed. St. Charles Borromeo died of the plague because he was assisting the people with sacraments who were dying of the plague in Milan. So he caught it and died of it. But, you know, uh, when uh, Robert E. Lee took over the, um, the army of the South in, uh, in 19, in 19, yeah, 1861, uh, he was uh, in his early 50s, mid-50s, maybe 55. They called him Granny. <laughs> because he was so old. How could such an old man lead an army? That was, they call him Granny. Granny Lee. <laughs> they did. Because life was short and very, you know, you could, uh, more people in that war died of disease than of getting shot. Dysentery, oh, you yeah, know, water was not very good and 
all, all sorts of so the the point is that uh, that affliction and shortness of life, contemplating the shortness of life, disease, etc., does make you think about the things of God. So it is a a blessing of God to afflict you in order to draw you away from thinking this is paradise on earth. There is a, always a drive in man to make paradise on earth. Always. It's always that conflict that arises from the Garden of Eden and original sin. You shall be like God, so you'll, you will be independent of God, and you're going to have your paradise too. And that drive is in human beings, and they're struck down all the time by adversity. And it's... It, and the, and the saints say, if you're not struck down by adversity, it's a sign of reprobation. A, that God has abandoned you. you know? So if, the, if evil people are not struck, you're through. So it, uh, this, the whole point of this, this, these spiritual conferences is the, the value of afflictions. So, <clears throat> St. Peter Damien said, when you are afflicted, when you suffer, be full of confidence. Don't murmur, don't become sad, don't become impatient, but always have serenity on your face, joy in your heart, and thanksgiving on your lips. St. Augustine said in a prayer to God, burn here, cut here provided that you spare in eternity. St. Teresa, her famous quote, to suffer or to die. Blessed Peter, the abbot of Clairvaux, having lost an eye as a result of a cruel disease, said this, I have escaped from one of my enemies, and I fear more that which is left to me than that which I have lost. Meaning his eye was a source of temptation to him. So he's, he's escaped from one of his enemies. He lost one of his eyes, but he still fears more the one that he still has. And I, I believe I told you about the uh, Carthusians who saw in Germany as I visited this place uh, in oh 1830s, I think it was, their whole place burned down. I, I may have mentioned this to you. And they were all standing outside looking at this place that was all up in flames. And the superior of the house said, let us sing a Te Deum. So St. Lawrence Justinian, having fallen ill in his old age, he was the patriarch of Venice, famous family, the Justiniani in Venice. His doctor felt obliged to cut away flesh, but soon he stopped, not daring to let the steel blade penetrate. But the great saint said to him, take courage, your iron would not be capable of equaling the sharp claws and the hot grills to which the martyrs were subject. Having been conducted to her torture, we just celebrated this feast, St. Cecilia said, Die a martyr. This is not to lose youth, but to exchange it for an eternal youth. It is to give mud and to receive gold. It is to give a poor habitation, vile and narrow, and to receive a greater one, the most splendid of all palaces. It is to give a perishable thing and to receive in return one that does not know any end. Actually, she seemed to live, uh, I visited where she, you can see where she was martyred in Rome. They did the excavations, and it's actually a, quite a beautiful house with mosaics and everything, and, and you can see just where she was cut down. 
in Rome if ever you have to go to Rome. The afflictions in this world are nothing in comparison to the, war, the reward and the eternal glory we, which awaits us. St. <clears throat> Paul said to the Romans, in a very famous quote, For I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed to us. That's Romans 8:18. 8, also, he said, for that which is at present momentary and light of our tribulation worketh for us above measure exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. St. Bonaventure said, the sufferings have long departed, but the reward never ends. The glory that I await, said St. Francis of Assisi, this is St. Bonaventure quoting St. Francis, is so great that all of the illnesses, all of the mortifications, all of the humiliations, and all the pains fill me up with joy. St. Francis of Assisi. He wrote a life of St. Francis, St. Bonaventure did. Afflictions are also a proof of predestination and love on the part of God. When he chastises, he wants to save the sinner. And to the contrary, impunity is a mark of the anger and reprobation of God, what I just said. If someone is a hardened sinner and he is not brought to his knees by tribulation, that is a sign of reprobation. It's a terrible sign. What, what gives me chills down my spine is when people who are hardened sinners, atheists, or, say, I'm not afraid of dying. Whereas the saints feared their judgment with a trembling fear. St. Saint Alphonsus, for example. If you don't have that basic fear of the Lord, which is the most fundamental of all religious acts, we might say, that to fear God in the sense that uh, both his punishments and his, his majesty, just the, the, his infinite majesty, the way you might fear something that is enormous, you know, have a certain, uh, that's the, 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 you know, the, the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, as sacred scripture says. It's the, the first step toward God is the fear of God. If you don't have that, and part of that is fear of his punishment, that's at least that. You can't fear hell without a grace. Do you know that? Even the fear of hell requires a grace. So if somebody says, oh, I, I don't want to go to hell, I don't want to go to hell. That's a sign of grace. It's the first step and turns toward God as a result of his fear of going to hell. That's the first sign of turning. It's the lowest, but it's there. You can't even think about your eternal salvation without the grace of God, without an actual grace. You can't even think about it. Just let me finish. So, St. Paul says that we should carry our afflictions with perseverance. He, this is the quote, always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. We saw that. St. Leo the Great said, we can expect with security the promised beatitude when we take part in the passion of the Lord. And just as always the Christian must live with piety, he must also always carry his cross. St. Augustine said, Now life and temporal ple pleasures are sweet, and tribulations, to the contrary, are bitter. But who would not drink the chalice of afflictions for fear of the fire of hell? Would, 
who would not have contempt for the delights of the world if he is yearning for the goods of eternal life? So he's saying, out of fear of hell, wouldn't you drink the chalice of afflictions in order to avoid hell? Well, then how much more would you uh, have contempt for the delights of the world for the goods of eternal life? Okay, that's the end of that.